why don't you summarize a little bit what the book is about, and then we'll get into Q&A. Okay, thanks a lot for having me. I'm a shameless shill these days, pushing my book everywhere uh, in the U.S. and Canada. The whole idea is you don't get rich writing a book, usually. Maybe I will, who knows, but... You, uh, this, this book is a sort of a labor of love. I've spent four years longer than any other project. It is very robust, 30 pages of end notes, very well researched because it's controversial. I'm American and Canadian and a business writer and an entrepreneur and a business prof. And so it's from that context and that viewpoint. I live, pay taxes, vote, and, uh, and play and, and work in both countries. And I really think they're both terrific countries. Uh, and one is not better than the other, in my opinion. So from that bias, I actually am a merger myself. Uh, and so I've taken a look about four years ago, and I travel a lot in my incarnation as a newspaper editor, and I've realized that a couple of things are happening in the world. The first chapter is called A Dangerous World, and it puts forth the existential challenges facing the United States and Canada, all countries for that matter. And basically, I characterize it as, you know, the Cold War 2.0 or the new economic Cold War, and it's state capitalism entities versus free enterprise. And our multinationals, Canadian, European, American, go out, go forth, try and find mining concessions and oil fields and do business and trade all around the world. And they are finding they are completely all, all, often beaten to the punch or undermined or whatever or cheated out of by state capitalism because China Inc. or Russia Inc. or Saudi Arabia Inc., Abu Dhabi Inc., basically they have corporations that all answer to the governments are tools to economically develop their nation state, their entity, and they are ruthless at whatever they do. So the first chapter is quite chilling, gives examples of, of some of the techniques that these various entities have used, and the dangers facing uh, free enterprise nations that aren't more protective, not protectionist, than we are. So that's existential challenge number one that brought me to write the book. The second problem is 26 years after two-way free trade, the border is worse than it was before. That has not happened in any other jurisdictions. The Europeans, of course, have gone very far in terms of integration. The Caribbean nations have customs and monetary unions. The West African nations have custom and monetary unions. And Canada and the US don't have either. Can't even get a security perimeter going, which would be blending law enforcement, immigration, customs, and the border is thickening. It is starting to create a need for manufacturers in Canada to relocate in the US because of the delays and, the, and all of the problems. Second chapter deals with that. Canada's existential challenges are a lot more serious, and he's touched on them. And basically, you have a population of 35 million, a piece of real estate bigger than the United States, slightly, full of buried treasure that has been completely ignored and neglected by the governments. Completely ignored and neglected. There's not a road, a railway, a seaport. There's not a pipeline in the vast majority of the country, 90% of the country. The First Nations or Aboriginal claims haven't been settled, which creates an impediment to development. There's nobody living up there. Compared to Siberia or Alaska, the amount of development in those hostile areas, it's pretty, it's pretty obvious there's a problem. Now, the world is not going to let our resources just stay buried. And, you know, maybe we'll be disrupted, maybe resources will be disrupted, but I don't think they will anytime that soon. Um, and in the meantime, all of the resources, and they have everything up there, we have everything up there in the Arctic. Uh, in that period of time, the Chinese have targeted the Koreans, the Japanese, the whole world is looking at at the resource development of Canada, and, and the infrastructure has to be built out. The Russians have declared the Arctic Russian. We can't keep it a park even if we want to. We don't have the capital or the military to defend and develop it. So I say, who's our partner? Who's already our partner? Who's our traditional partner? You may not think the Americans are, are worthy of being your full-fledged full partner, but here's a number of different models for further integration. The Americans are the natural partner and would be the best partner, and they, the, the, the complementary nature of what we have, what they have, could really set both peoples up for prosperity and technological advance and so on. Canada has one other problem that relates to this space, and that is a brain drain. There's a few brains in this room that have drained. Canada is losing every decade the population 
a population the size of Quebec City to the United States. TechCrunch says there's a quarter of a million Canadians in the, in the valley. I would double that because a lot of people are here on visas or semi-legally or whatever are doing business here. Uh, there's three million Canadians living full and part-time in the U.S., a million Americans plus our children living in Canada. I think the merger is underway. And we are also very dependent economically on the United States economically, as I say, one in, six out of every 10 retail dollars is spent at an American chain in Canada. The degree of ownership of the resource sector, the manufacturing sector is, is pretty, pretty mature. So that's the sort of existential reasons. Millions of jobs could be created, a build out of the United States, by the United States with capital. Canada has an aging population. Resource jobs through fast tracking of immigration both ways could really be beneficial. So I wrote this book. Most Canadians hate this idea, big time. I say, well, take a, a dispassionate look at your opportunities and your challenges going forward. American reactions are different. Americans are, if they know anything about Canada or care at all, go, gee, that's interesting, wow. Okay, so I'm there, and I'm, the book is really designed to start the conversation in both countries, and I think it is. We so, just got a letter from uh, Hillary, Clinton. Hillary Clinton three weeks ago. She read the book, said it was thought-provoking, interesting, and uh, wished me well in the publication. And she's a, uh, she has taken a great interest as Secretary of State in the, uh, in the Arctic. She disrupted, there's an anecdote in my book, she disrupted a conference, a cozy little conference Canada had organized, thinking the Americans would come and just have a big love in. And she came and she had a, a meltdown, actually, over the lack of participants, the structure of it, and the whole mentality uh, of, of the Arctic conference. So, you know, it's interesting. I've had other people, Ken Taylor, former ambassador to Iran from Canada, kind of a national hero in both countries. He said, Diane, you've written a courageous book. He said this at my Ma Manhattan book launch. Written a Cana courageous book, Canadians have, are asleep, they have to wake up. So, you know, there's things happening and we'll see. Um, I think that, as I say, the, mo the, the merger's already underway. Uh, I just thought maybe it'd be fun for Canadians to think about it and manage the process before we just fall into the arms of being under the U.S. influence completely. My old business partner used to refer to Canada as the junior varsity team, which is <laughs> driving me a little bit nuts. Question at the back. No, I take it for granted, granted that there'd be support in the United States for uh, such an occurrence. Uh, what, what percentage of Canadians? Would it even be 20 percent? That's a great. That's a great question. Um, I have a whole chapter on the politics, which are impossible. You know, I mean, you look at the political systems; they're both dysfunctional. Make no mistake, Canada has hasn't got a very functional democracy either. Um, so, you know, the, that would be daunting. And of course, I looked at the German full-on merger, and that was because of a crisis. But if there's a crisis, of course, that would make it easier. But the polling, the last poll I saw, they're very sparse in number, is in 1964, 49% uh, of American of Canadians in a Gallup poll said, yeah, they would merge with the US, no problem. Now, mostly it's bubbling around at the 20%. There's about 20% who say, yeah, 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 I don't care, of course. Uh, then there's about 40% undecideds, and then maybe 40% uh-uh, no way. But then if you go more granular in the questioning, there was a very interesting uh, poll about two years ago by the social values of social scientists, and they saw that for a security perimeter, which eliminates the border virtually, which goes pretty far in terms of integration, um, if uh, that, that registered a 65% uh, favorability uh, among Canadians for security perimeter. And then another survey in 2011 by Woodrow Wilson, University of Western Ontario, showed that there were 42% of Canadians, 41, 42, who said, yeah, get rid of the border if it improves my quality of life, and about 62% in the US. So there's something to build on, but boy, public opinion would have to be on side, both sides of the border. Question. Well, you have to read the book. Have you read the book? No, I haven't. No. You read the book. The first model, which I worked on with an investment banker, was fun to work on. And it's just hypothetical. Uh, actually, it is a reverse takeover, the way it's structured. 
Uh, that's e equally impossible. Uh, but basically, if you looked at the two countries as companies, you have one big guy and one little guy. They both have the same proportion of debt, by the way. Canada's indebtedness uh, per GDP, government indebtedness, because our subnationals are hugely in debt, um, is the same as the U.S. But t putting that aside, we looked at it and we said, okay, if Canadians uh, take back a mortgage to pay, to to compensate them for the over-contribution of unexploited assets that they would bring into a partnership over and above the 10% ownership. Uh, they would be the biggest creditors in the world to the partnership, and they would, of course, then be entitled to the vice presidency, run treasury, the Fed, and so on and so forth. I mean, that would be the way it would work out. So in actual fact, it would, be a it would have to be a reverse takeover if it was done as an investment banking deal. But these are countries, not companies. Right. I mean, they're elected. Yeah, it was just a model for fun. Oh, Lord. That would be the kiss of death in Canada. Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. If you look at the diaspora of Canadians in, in, the, in, uh, in, in the United States, uh, there's about 3 million that are, are living at full and part-time in, in the U.S. that are Canadian. Then there's probably another couple of million that gave up the citizenship a long time ago when you couldn't be a dual. Uh, and so, you know, but if you look at, at American residents with one Canadian parent, you could be up to about 10, 12 million, pure guess. If you look at those with grandparents, you could be up to 20, 25 million, and Sarah Palin's grandfathers both came from Canada. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I have one question. So could that be a model of Commonwealth, like between the relationship between the United States and Puerto Rico? I'm uh, sorry? Com com the model of Commonwealth. Like the so former Soviet Union, they when they break down, they they fall into uh, 17 different countries, former Commonwealth. Right. Same between United States and uh, Puerto Rico, probably China and Taiwan as well in the future. Is that a could question? It a, could it become a could become a? My question is that could that be a, a form of Commonwealth rather than a virtualization? Oh sure, no, I have that model in the in the in the book. I have that model. You have to look at the model. It, I look, when I look at the German full-on merger as a political entity, and remember that was a crisis after the Iron Curtain came down, and East Germany was bust and a, and a basket case, and the West Germans went, oh my goodness, we have to do something, and they did it in 11 months. Uh, but if you look at that kind of model, if we ever did anything like that, we have Quebec. Quebec to, what, is, is, a, is a real outlier region. And we have other outlier regions. I would argue Alberta's pretty outlier and BC is pretty outlier. So we have a lot of regions and you have a lot of regions. I suggested that if we actually did a full-on German merger, Canada would be entitled to 13 states, 13 states. But Quebec may say, we don't want to be a state, we want to be a commonwealth like Puerto Rico. So they'd have their own CEO and do their own thing, official language and all that. I mean, you know, this is something that public opinion on both sides of the border would have to agree to. I'm just trying to alert uh, the publics in both that, you know, they have some, they're, they're looking at some serious challenges coming at them, and I don't know how quickly, but uh, I think that the, Canada has, has, a, has a basic, uh, has probably the bigger existential problem. And, you know, by some political scientists, Canada really, given its economic and military dependence, is a semi-autonomous jurisdiction of the United States already anyway. Uh, Mr. Rothkopf in, in, in uh, Power Inc. describes states like Canada that don't have big militaries and don't have other characteristics as semi-states. And Canada's going to lose its place in the G20 in about 10 years in relative terms because it's, it's small and it has a mature population. So there's a lot of uh, reasons why I want people to be rattled. Is there a model where Canada just becomes one of the states? One? I, I mean, just because so. of the, just because if you look at the relative size, it's it's not big, but from a population perspective, no, GDP perspective, no, 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 that would that would not fly. But, you know, who knows uh, what may happen down the road through through you know, a crisis or something. But uh, the whole idea that it would be a 51st state is is certainly not on. I mean, you've got uh, the treasure trove. I have some estimates as to uh, what's up there, and then of course the value of strategic value of the Arctic in terms of a logistical trade route, uh, all those things, um, no. Okay, question. Before the political union, <coughs> should you have been elected president? 
So in the book, when you read it, if you read it, uh, talk about the various steps from a free trade agreement like we have, which is a preliminary step. Then you do a security perimeter slash, then you do a customs union, which is worker back and forth, goods and services. Then you do, then you look at a monetary union. With two countries, by the way, in monetary policy, we move in lockstep with the Americans anyway. You know, our float as a nation currency is very small, but it's very emotional. I would argue as long as Queen Elizabeth is alive, they wouldn't want to change their dollar bill. But once Charles takes over, they may think twice about putting George Washington there instead. So the Canadian dollar. So, you know, I think that you've got a situation where you can do it slowly in stages. Uh, the Eurozone was uh, badly devised and very complicated, and the Euro is okay now. Um, but maybe that, but the monetary union should be studied. Uh, Robert Mundell, who, a Canadian who won the Nobel, said that when Canada's dollar reaches parity with the U.S., that's when you go single currency. Uh, NAFTA includes Mexico. Why yes. not throw it in the mix? Mexico's not ready to have its border opened with us. Mexico may reach that point, but you cannot throw open a border and have any kind of a, a greater integration with Mexico, given its weak institutions, corruption, its drug problem, and the fact that incomes are a third of what they are here. We just have a, a flood of people. Uh, it wouldn't affect the relationship, even if the two took the next step. For five years, I've been arguing in my columns that we should decouple from NAFTA, not to turn our backs on Mexico, but to realize the synergies, my fourth chapter is on the synergies, that would be realized if we integrate and, and remove some of the obstacles, or all of them, uh, uh, in the two countries. Here we'll go here, and then there, and then there. Why did the free trade agreement fail, and how could it be fixed? Well, it hasn't failed. The second chapter is on the binational problems. I think some of it is, is the fact that it's just not a front burner issue. Nobody tends the garden. Uh, we also have not done a very good job in Canada of drug interdiction. And now there are drones uh, along parts of the US-Canada border and thousands of, of police and so on because Canada's become the largest exporter in the world of meth and ecstasy. And, you know, big, vast, open places, rent a farmhouse, rent, a, rent an old brewery, and start a meth lab. Uh, also, British Columbia is a culture of marijuana growing, and the figures I have from the RCMP websites extrapolated the street value of the marijuana exports from BC into the United States. Easy to get across the border. Actually, I traveled with a smuggler. I did, I actually smuggled something with him. Uh, it's very easy. Um, because um, uh, is, is greater than the sum total of the auto parts exports from Canada to the US, which is the largest manufactured goods. It's under the radar because it's illegal. Interesting. Um, maybe I didn't get it. And uh, terrorism problems, too. Concern about terrorism. Is, is that because the, your border's northern border is essentially unprotectable? Um, no, it is, it is being monitored. It is being carefully thought of. Uh, two of the former heads of the uh, Canadian Security Service said that Canada has not they said publicly, very uncharacteristically, they're quoted in there saying Canada has not taken the terrorism thing uh, to heart seriously enough. We've let in a lot of questionable people inside our country the Americans have been concerned about. We've had a number of incidents, terrorist incidents, and the first Al-Qaeda attack was mounted out of Montreal by an Algerian who got stopped at the border, uh, Washington State border. He was going to blow up LA airport. So that these things are, are concerns to Homeland Security. So now there's a passport requirement uh, for Americans to re-enter from Canada, Mexico, or the Caribbean, which has absolutely clobbered our tourism. Our tourism sector is down 30% since then. It's a problem. We're choking on the north side. Uh, who benefits the most? I, I, I wasn't completely clear for me in the, in the beginning. Do the Americans benefit more or do the Canadians benefit more? Well, I think it's win-win. Uh, Canada doesn't have the manpower, the capital, or the military to develop and defend its resource base. Uh, and the United States needs jobs. So if you did a build-out of infrastructure in the North to prepare for development, in, in a sustainable way, obviously, uh, with American capital, it would also create 
lots of jobs. Canada has a skills and job shortage looming just with the projects on the drawing boards now of one to two million workers in the next decade. And so I say, why shouldn't that come from Americans? American workers, that would be an obvious. Um, and yet there is no, in, there is no, as people here can attest who live in both countries or travel back and forth, there is no re, you know, reasonable fast track immigration visa process, work permit process yet between these two free trade partners, which has been a real impediment uh, on, on both sides of the border. Question over there. Should be win-win. If it isn't, it won't happen. Oh, it has to be Canada. The United States, and I have documents from the free trade discussions, the Americans would, of course, naturally be happy to grow uh, their country and, and consider something like this if it benefited them. But they're also very sensitive to the Canadian feelings that, you know, if you have some gi giant like the U.S. saying, uh, I think we should merge, that looks like an offer you can't refuse. Uh, and it is actually. So they, with the free trade situation, for decades the Americans just waited for Canada. They, they said, well, pounce on it if they're interested, and it took Canada in 1985 to realize it couldn't survive economically without it. And then it happened in two years. So I'm thinking about the, the U.S. was founded kind of on hunger, right? There were so many immigrants that came here that really cultivated the soil. There's so much homesteading going on most recently. And just, you know, a hunger for ambition, for something better, that's, that's kind of what we're founded upon. Um, and then we've been talking these last few days about the fact that our employment growth is largely attributed to entrepreneurship. Um, but then you also mentioned that in Canada, you know, they're not too keen on the merge that you're speaking of. So there isn't a hunger, really, to you know, to help to continue to grow in the mindset that we're trying to continue to cultivate in this country. So wouldn't there be an, a fundamental clash of cultures? Well, uh, to a certain extent, but not along those lines. Uh, entrepreneurship is, is thriving in Canada, and I would argue that many of them are here. Uh, like this fellow, uh, we lose them. And, uh, but, you know, there is entrepreneurship in Canada. There's a, a risk-taking culture. Uh, and yes, they develop differently, and, and it's interesting in the book, I do talk about the differences between the two countries. The competitive advantage of the U.S. is risk-taking and entrepreneurship. The ability to fail, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and go forward, that's not the case in the rest of the world, and, uh, but I think that increasingly, uh, I, don't, I don't think it's a big gap, a huge gap. The other interesting difference is that Canada really was a colony until 31. Uh, they talk about 1867 as independence, but the British, until 1931, had control over their foreign policy, pulled them into the First World War, the Boer War, without any permissions, and had to approve every piece of law. So in 1931, they left being a colony, but why that's important is one of the most Im uh, serious differentials, the U.S. to the rest of the world, you mentioned homesteading, I deal with in the in the book, is, is in the... Uh, first or second assembly in, in Philadelphia, uh, leading up to the Revolutionary uh, War, uh, the crown lands were confiscated, put in public domain, and handed out to colonize the country through homesteading and so on. 90% uh, of Canada's land mass, which is slightly larger than the United States, is owned by the crown still. The crown being not the crown crown, although the British monarch is the head of state. Um, symbolically, but the governments of Canada own 90% of the landmass. Therefore, I describe Canada as the world's biggest real estate holding company whose shareholders don't even realize it. <laughs> don't even realize it. So only, only about 10% was privatized, whereas 60% of the United States landmass, including Alaska, were pri was privatized. 40% is still public domain. Big difference. And that creates enterprise. Do you believe that the merger that you describe in, in your book apply to, I don't know, the, the EU and Russia, uh, China and Southeast Asia, China and Australia? I mean, do, do you see or have you looked at? Yes, you know, I did. Yeah, I looked at uh, Australia and New Zealand are already having a pretty lively debate. And it's interesting. It's exactly the same. The Australians are saying, come on in any time. The New Zealanders, like Canada, small, dependent, brain drain problems are saying, no, 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 no. We don't want to lose our culture. We don't want to be swallowed up by you. 
but they are already starting to talk about it. Their elected officials are talking about it. In Canada, no elected official has touched this book yet. Uh, the separatist leader is about to make some kind of announcement this week in Quebec, and I think it'll be probably quite a shock. They may actually support it as a means of, of uh, cutting a special side deal for Quebec. Um, the South Koreans have talked openly, if they haven't already, about a reunification tax to collect the $2 trillion uh, in the hopes that once the North becomes free, they can rebuild it like East and West Germany did. I looked at the cost of East and West Germany. And uh, yeah, and then there's also the reverse process where boundaries make no sense. That's the more common. Scotland, Quebec, um, Syria, but, but those Iraq. Are still those are still very small. I'm talking about like Russia and the EU. I mean, merging effectively very large entities. No, they're fighting over Ukraine right now. They're fighting about everything. But yeah, Russia's not going to merge with anybody. They're just going to gobble up whatever they can. I'm very upset about the Ukrainian situation. I don't know if you're watching it. I don't think the publicity has been uh, extensive enough. I covered the Orange Revolution, and I'm, I have a lot of Ukrainian friends. That's a very serious issue. But that's a different topic. Question there. Um, from a political and uh, a legal standpoint, how would you see the systems merging? Because I think there's a pretty large philosophical difference in the way that Canada approaches those two things versus the US. Well, you, you got to read the book. I have different models. So there's two or three political models. There's five economic models, including something as minimal, actually, as a big joint venture in the three Arctic territories with the Americans, where you sell them right of first refusal to jobs and to uh, leases, permits to explore and develop. Uh, and you do that. They, they get the right of first refusal after Canadians. And so that would be worth a lot of money, and that would, be, that would bind us together nicely and do the job. Uh, short of doing anything else. But what I find really quite remarkable is what the Europeans have done. There's been a lot of publicity about the Eurozone, but that, that was for a, a number of other reasons. But consider that you, had, you have 28 countries now. These are tribes that have been slaughtering each other for centuries. They don't have a border between them. It's quite remarkable. And they keep their distinctness, their, their tax, legal, health care systems. They finessed it. If they can do it, why can't we? So you would say it being somewhat separate still from that perspective, as opposed to Probably, integrating fully? Probably, but anything can happen. I don't know. I've lived uh, 10 years in Canada, 10 years in the US, 10 years in Europe. And although the culture in Canada is quite American in one sense, the uh, social structures, political thinking is pretty much right down the middle. Uh, and it's actually a very nice balance between uh, uh, the kind of structures in the UK, say, and the structures in, in the US is a very practical balance between the two. The other so. thing that's interesting on the software, if I can use it, the human software side as a person who's bicultural, uh, Canadians have a British sensibility. Uh, and that means manners are, are held in very high esteem, which is very, very genteel and very nice. Deportment and dress is important, how you eat, how you in interact with other people, um, not being boastful, all those kinds of things, and not showing off, uh, a gloating is frowned on. And so that's a British sensibility. I would characterize the American sensibility as Germanic. Uh, it is, contrary to what people think, but about 18% of Americans in the census, that's more than African Americans and Hispanics, do cite that they have German American, G Germanic roots. They are German American. Uh, I come from the US Midwest, very pervasive. Uh, lots of Germans everywhere, people with Germanic names. So the Germanic sensibility is what rubs the Canadians the wrong way. That is the directness, the bluntness, the real work ethic, the enthusiasm, the gloating, the yes, and all of that. That is very American. And so is the technological uh, aptitude, the uh, manufacturing capability. I'm being very generalizing here, but, but I think that that is the reason why there is friction socially between Canadians and Americans and why Canadians look down on Americans. And I don't think they should, of course, but. Yes. Hi, Dan. Just in the context of exponential te technologies and exponential societies, 
shouldn't we be at this point actually be questioning the entire concept of the nation state rather than trying to bolster them and make them bigger? That's another book. I didn't write it yet. <laughs> So we, uh, you know, uh, we've been talking about the idea that nation states are uh, too big and too brittle to really manage themselves going forward. I mean, the U.S. is a mess because of the information and availability, and there's such a difference. Paul Sappho, that you heard from, has, has said, has said uh, here at a previous CP that he has, a, he says, there's a 50-50, 50-50 chance that the U.S. does not exist as a country within 30 years. Right? That's a pretty big statement. And generally, when we kind of travel around the world, we find that the power is shifting from the nation state down to the city state, right? Um, but the construct, but the construct won't fall anytime too soon because the political elites have the, the control, the power. If the central government in Canada owns 90% of the land, and the provinces combined, and that's kind of the, the, that that ownership structure would stay, in, at least in that particular case. Uh, but your point is well taken. Uh, How much of the land? And I think that Carter, I, I, you know, oh my, Kenichi oh my talks about in his book, uh, uh, books uh, uh, that that maps are cartographic illusions. Uh, if you look at what's going on in the Middle East, if you look at what's going on in North Africa and Africa, these were arbitrary borders. I would also submit South Asia and North America. Uh, these were arbitrary borders imposed by the colonial powers that irrespective of ethnic, tribal backgrounds and glue and religious differences. So what you have in the Middle East now playing out for, for two generations, I would guess, is the, the, the religious wars of the Protestant Catholic, you have the ethnic wars, and so, you know, these, this is the problem. You're absolutely right, but it's even beyond that because the new super elites, the new super entrepreneurs actually don't even define themselves in terms of nation states. That's right. That's so right. the people you really want to attract, and I mean, this is largely irrelevant to them. Yeah. You have to make it attractive for people to come and do interesting things. Well, right? people are arbitraging too. I mean, I arbitrage myself. I left the U.S. for Canada. I had a British husband. I've got European citizenship. I wouldn't hesitate to leave Canada if there was any kind of reason to leave Canada. And you didn't hesitate to leave. You wouldn't hesitate to leave the U.S. for another opportunity. So the globalized people, the 220 million who live when they, where they weren't born, have arbitraged, they, arb they, play, they arbitrage countries. And that is increasingly happening. And you know that's going to play out in some other way. Also, on your point, I would argue that the US-Canada border is an artificial one drawn by the British. It's the, it's the border that they were able to hold to keep the Americans out without an occupying force. Pretty clever. It there's a question over here. So, yes, question. The, when you speak of Canada, the 90% owned by the government, how much of the country uh, can you cultivate? How much is really usable? Much of the United States that's public are sides of mountains, you know, water, you know, we, they're not really fu usable, and that's a, a big fun function of how they're national parks. Uh, isn't a great part of Canada really un uncultivable? You can't... Uh, other than by expensive costs. Well, it's interesting. It. It's interesting. Um, I'll give you a couple of examples. Siberia has a population larger than Canada and is the largest oil, copper, gold, diamond producer on the planet, has 55 seaports, has rail since the 19th century, has roads, has about a dozen cities with a half a million or more people in them. And so Siberia has been built out. Uh, in Alaska, let's talk about Alaska. Oil and gas was discovered 30 years ago, Prudhoe Bay, and 30 years ago, oil and gas in probably the same amounts was discovered in Canada in the top of the Northwest Territories. In eight years, deals were made with the aboriginals, the environmentalists, the pipeline was already finished, and Alaska has a population of 700 million, a heritage fund of $60 billion, royalty payments annually to every man, woman, and child, has roads, 25 seaports, rail, uh, has 21 mines that are in progress or in operation. The three Arctic territories in Canada have a population of Waco, Texas. Some of the claims haven't even been settled. The poverty rates are horrific, and there's not any infrastructure up there. There is a two-lane dirt road called the Dempster Highway. The pipeline was never built. The permit hasn't even been granted. What's your view on the Keystone Pipeline? Keystone Pipeline. Do you know what the Ooh. Keystone Pipeline is? 
You worked on the financing for the Keystone. <laughs> I think the Keystone Pipeline well, has Describe become, it for a minute. Just oh, so Keystone understand. Pipeline is a, a proposal to build a pipeline across the border, a couple thousand miles to Gulf refineries to carry bitumen, which is a gooey tar-like substance from the oil sands, about 800,000 barrels a day to these refineries. Uh, it, obviously, 800,000 barrels a day is a lot of dough for Canada, and it's a very important initiative. Uh, another one similar to it was approved by Obama, in, in, and I think the, the bitumen's already flowing. We have 81 pipelines crossing the border, but this one became a political football. And I think it became a political football because of um, it was very high profile. Um, the environmental movement is much better organized, and they've targeted the, the, the fossil fuel as well as the oil sands as enemy number one. Um, and then, of course, the Republicans backed it. And with a Democratic president, that didn't exactly endear it. And Canadians have an attitude in Washington that lobbies, lobbying is beneath them. So it was a confluence of a lot of different things. This may be the pipeline too far. Uh, I don't know whether it'll happen or not. What do you think of the uh, the Athabasco oil sands? The, the, to extract the oil there is incredibly expensive. Um, and aren't they essentially out of date already? Not really. Um, there's lots of people that are buying in and want to build pipelines to tap into it. Um, I think that I think that your your point is well taken. Technology is going to end the age of oil, and it's a matter of when is that date. Is it is it 2030 as the Japanese Miti thought 40 years ago when I interviewed the <coughs> Minister of Trade in Tokyo? They thought by 2030 the age of oil was over. I don't know. I, I doubt it. Um, so you know, basically, it the emissions. Issue, let's talk about emissions as well as expense, but just the emissions issue uh, of extracting that oil from extraction to, it's an open pit mining operation actually, and some of it is steam injected and it's melted and it's brought to the surface. But it's, it's about as dirty a fuel to produce emissions wise as the heavy oil in California, which is about 8% of the US production. So. You know, it's it's picked on because it is the world's largest, uh, largest uh, uh, repository of fossil fuel in a state, and maybe the only one in a safe jurisdiction of that size, left in the world. So, the environmental movement has targeted it, and they're they're pretty effective in in what they're doing. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Do you have to uh, buy the country, or, or can you do what China's doing, and that's basically coming in and just buying all, all the assets? So I, I live in BC, and yes, we export a lot of bud, but our number one export is uh, coal to China. Yeah. Have you read the book? I have not no, read No, when you read the book, you'll see that there's many ways to cut a deal and make this happen, and to the, detri to the improvement of, of the Canadian situation to address our challenges. There's many ways to do it. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that um, we'll see what happens. Yeah, it, it just seems that we might be a better fit with China than the U.S. because they've got all this demand and we've got all these resources, no, we've got all this space, my, they've got read, all these people. Read my, read my first chapter about how China Inc. behaves, okay. including in Canada, well, they, in they, several instances. They've essentially moved in to, to Vancouver. I mean, it's, uh, it's incredible. The, uh, the Asian influence that's, that's Well, that's immigration, that's different. But I'm talking about taking control of major projects and construction work and, and then p political influence and that sort of thing. I mean, I, I think China's an amazing country. I think what they have done, that government, is miraculous. <laughs> to lift, uh, to elevate to a middle class, a population as big as North America's in the European Union is magnificent. Uh, and I know there's problems and there's negatives and all of that, but you have to give them their due. They have to create 300,000 jobs a month. They have to feed all those people. They need those resources to feed their economic engine. And they are really good at it. And what they've done in Africa, what they're doing around the world, and what they intend to do in Canada, the U.S., is, is very interesting. But my big problem is... They have to be able to, they have to obey the rule of law in Canada, and they tried to get away with that recently. 
uh, in Canada with their companies and many countries around the world. And the next thing is reciprocity. You know, when the Chinese buy Nexen in Calgary, our biggest, one of our biggest oil companies are Smithfield Foods in the United States, American and Canadian companies cannot buy that equivalent in China. That's one way, that's very, very damaging. And that's not in the spirit of fair free trade. So until we get the investment reciprocity piece fixed, and that's what I argue a lot in this book and I've argued in Canada, you know, we shouldn't be allowing them to buy stuff we can't buy there. Then it's fine. Then I don't have a problem with it. Any last questions? Yes, Brad. So you played at a whole bunch of levels from uh, you know, the Raptors we have now to something in the lower advisor, Schengen like, and then international relations. My impression is the Americans wouldn't go as far as the international power in this country. <coughs> What is your, what's your optimistic prediction of how far it could go? Well, I think that, uh, I think the conversation is starting, Brad, in both countries. I know it is. Uh, the business community in Canada issued the big business uh, roundtable equivalent, issued a press release recently saying, let's get this security perimeter on track here. This is crazy. We wouldn't have done that before. Uh, Harper, the prime minister, two days ago issued a press release saying to the United Nations, we're going, to, we're going to take another look at our Arctic claims. We're going to extend them, just like Russia has. And yesterday, Mr. Putin reacted with military maneuvers and little saber rattling in the Arctic and said, well, uh, the Arctic is Russian, so good luck. So, you know, that kind of thing is happening. Um, I think realistically, I think that in 10 or 20 years, we're going to end up with an EU construct, like a fourth level of government, binational, 50-50, maybe monetary union, for sure the border gone, a security perimeter to facilitate flow of people, goods, and services. I think that's more realistic, and that would be fine. And then everybody could keep intact their health care, legal systems, their cultural things. But remember, at the end of the day, nothing may happen because, as Peter Drucker said famously, cultures eat strategy for breakfast. You know, you know the famous joke. I had to look up the exact wording, which was, Canada had the chance to enjoy English government, French culture, and American know-how. But of course, we ended up with English know-how, French government, and American culture. <laughs> 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 On that note, thank you, Diane Francis. Thank you all for a great discussion. Thank you, Brad, for closing it up. <laughs>